So people are signing on. Welcome everybody. We'll just let everybody kind of log in. Happy March hosted at home. Give it a few more seconds. Okay, all right. I'm gonna go ahead and get started. So hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to your host at home happy hour. I am Kaylee Seaholm, the Assistant Manager of Virtual Experiences here for the wineries. And today we are celebrating women in wine and we are joined by Brooke Bobiak, our fabulous winemaker at Bella Union and Julia Coney, who is an award-winning wine journalist. So just a few things before we get started. If you have any questions that come up while these two are talking about the wines, go ahead and put them in the Q&A. And if you have any comments or wanna chat between each other, go ahead and put that in the chat section. And once we've tasted through the wines, we are going to promote everybody to panelists where we will highly encourage you to turn on your cameras and join in for the group Q&A and a happy hour toast. All right, without further ado, everyone grab a glass of the 2018 Post and Beam Cabernet and cheers. I'm gonna pass it over to Julia. Thank you, thank you so much, Kaylee. Hello, everyone. Hey, Brooke. You hey, Julia. Me, right? Are you ready? I'm excited. I'm ready. Anytime I could drink some Californian you know, wines, especially like big bowl Cabernets. That's Cabernet, everyone, if you don't know. Um, I'm Julia Coney, I'm a wine journalist. And Cabernet was my, California Cabernet was my introduction to wine in my late twenties. And for me, it is always a special place. So it's an honor to be in your homes with you all for this night. I love hosting these, these are so much fun. So Brooke, introduce yourself to the lovely, our lovely esteemed people who are watching this. Yeah, hi everyone. It's, it's nice to be here with you all. Um, I'm Brooke Bobiak. I am the new Bella Union winemaker. Um, I'm so excited to be here with you, Julia, and talk about um, our latest release with the 2018 Bell Union Rutherford Cab, as well as the 2018 Post and Beam. So, yeah, this this should be super fun. This is so much fun because, of course, this wine wine brings people together, but everyone has a different way of how they come to wine. I used to work uh, be a legal assistant, and I came through wine through Texas Barbecue and Napa Valley Cabernet. That was my introduction from the attorney I worked with. My family does not drink uh, by choice. They just never really drank. So, and I discovered it with Tex in Texas. So for me, coming to wine has always just been like, when I tell people I was a legal assistant who became a beauty writer, who became a wine writer. So I have all this like past. So I love to ask people when I first talk with them, why wine? Like, what was it? Like, what happened to go, hmm, I'm, I'm gonna be a winemaker. Cause I mean, you know, no one, I don't think really people, people now may say start out and go to school. Like I'm gonna be a winemaker, but like why wine? Yeah, though, that's such a great question. And like you said, I think um, more and more people know that that is a possible career path and opportunity. Um, at the time, uh, gosh, when I grew up and going to high school, I never really imagined myself being in the wine world. My, I grew up in San Diego. There's um, my parents are not in the wine industry and, um, yeah, so pretty much it just all started with a trip to Burgundy in France. I was, uh, studying at UC Davis at the time and I saw a super cool opportunity to sign up for a summer abroad in Burgundy and I just couldn't pass up that opportunity. It just sounded so much fun. Um, so of course I had to, you know, sign up and, um, you know, I was there for a summer. It was, co-taught by a UC Davis professor and a University of Dijon at Burgundy professor. And I mean, I just never looked back. It was just so much fun going to all the wineries and just seeing kind of like the, the passion that everyone had um, for their product. Um, and I mean, it just kind of uh, brought kind of the awareness to me of like, whoa, hey, this is a career that I can that I could do that's possible. So I just, I did everything in my power to, you know, change my major and I ended up studying viticulture enology and I just never looked back. So just kind of, yeah, I kept on that road of, of learning everything that I possibly could along the way. 
but you didn't, but when you enter UC Davis and a lot of people on this call, UC Davis in California is considered the wine school. Like that's where people go to study wine, viticulture, enology, wine studies, wine business management, but you didn't go to major in wine. Like what, <laughs> what was your major at UC Davis when you left high school? Yeah, no, it's so funny because um, I actually went to UC Davis, uh, not for the wine. I went because I loved the campus. I loved, I loved the town. I mean, it's just so charming. It's super bikeable. You can bike everywhere. Um, and I, yeah, so it was undecided, but I thought that I would either go towards like pre-med or maybe I would do like environmental science something along the lines, you know, a science or kind of hands-on career. Uh, and then, yeah, as luck would have it, I, I ended up finding a career that like fused both of that together. I love like getting my hands dirty. I love like walking in the vineyards and being in the cellar. And so just like that science, that hands-on stuff, it just all kind of came together. I'm like, wow. Okay. Like there's a lot to be said about just kind of being in the right place at the right time. So I feel super lucky. Um, I was, I was there. Um, and so happy that I, I ended up majoring in, in that. It's just been so great. But when you go to Burgundy and also everyone in the age to drink in France is 18. So, I mean, she's yep. like, so you weren't legal to drink in the U S but you were legal to drink. <laughs> no. in France, right? yep. and you, and you, you're visiting these wineries with your professors. Now, did you need to know the language? Was language a problem? You're in Dijon. Luckily, like in <laughs> luckily, no. Luckily, the classes were taught in English. Um, I had been to France like a couple times before uh, with super broken French or knowledge of French, just like basics. So luckily, like, you know, we were learning these, uh, you know, introduction to wine. There was also a course in wine sensory evaluation. And so luckily that was all in English because I was able to take in, um, you know, everything while I was there. So yeah, that was good. Wait, 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 <laughs> I, I, did you explain that for me? Because I'm very curious. What is a wine sensory and evaluation class? Like, what is that? So, I mean, it's, like basically what it is is it involves going to from winery to winery within burgundy meeting the producers the growers and going down into their cellar and tasting their wine and uh basically just pretty much as fun as you could imagine it would be um and and but very detail oriented too um and and like learning um yeah just kind of the basics of wine making and wine growing as well and um, like sensory, um, you know, the, the chemistry, just, you know, like the basic chemistry of like wine itself. So yeah, it was just a good broad overall introduction to the world of wine. Okay. So then you, you have this semester and you come back and you're like, I'm, I want to work in wine. Did you know what part of wine you wanted to work in or you just knew you wanted to work in the wine industry? I was set that I was, I was pretty set on winemaking. Um, for me, it was either going to be um, wine, like grape growing or winemaking. Um, and I wanted to make sure like, you know, before I graduated, like what, what is my path? So I ended up doing a seller internship while I was still enrolled. And then, um, you know, a couple more after I graduated. And um, I just had so much fun, like dragging hoses in the cellar and, you know, watching fruit come into the winery and um, yeah, it just, it clicked. So it's perfect. Well, I mean, working at a winery, I know there's this beauty and glamour that is associated with it, but wine is really hard. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, and I have to say this, if you haven't been to a winery, when you say hose, we have to say, it's not the, like the garden hose that you can no. wear. Like <laughs> the hoses are heavy. They're big. And that, that's how we, you, we keep the wineries clean, that all those moving parts. And did, did you only do that in California or did you go study, like, did you go stage in different countries and different places? Yeah, so uh, after, after graduating at UC Davis, um, I headed straight to Italy in Tuscany and I had a brief internship uh, in Tuscany, just outside of Lucca and Pisa there. And it was a super cool experience. Uh, I lived on the land. Uh, they were completely 100% like self-sustainable. They had their own garden. They made their own pasta. Obviously they made their own wine and their own <laughs> olive oil. <laughs> um, and it was just like such an amazing experience. Um, and, and the industry itself has 
giving me a lot of really awesome opportunities along the way, learning opportunities. I also um, spent uh, like a season in New Zealand in the south part of the North Island in Hawke's Bay. And that was also just like an incredible experience working with um, we focused that winery that I worked with focused primarily on Cabernet Sauvignon, Chardonnay, as well as a little bit of um, Syrah. So, and you know, it's the the whole travel experience and you know meeting other winemakers, um, just kind of having that global global view or global experience has helped out quite a bit. Now you said New Zealand, like that's when I think of New Zealand, I think the land of Oz. That's what I like to call it, and. Cabernet, like, are the client? Did you, were the climates very similar to California? Are they different? Because once again, we're talking this beautiful Cabernet fruit. Like, what what did you notice of the difference? Because at this point, you would have tasted right some yeah California cabs compared to New Zealand Cabernet. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, the Hawks Bay region where I was um, where I was working is one of the warmer climates of New Zealand compared to where, you know, Sauvignon Blanc is grown a little bit more south of there. Uh, and, uh, you know, the way it is, its proximity to it, the bay, it is very much a Mediterranean climate, similar to Napa. And of course, like the, the soil profiles and there's, you know, like little nuances and differences here and there. Um, and yeah, like given that it is kind of in that Mediterranean climate, I think that Cabernet really thrives in that region as well. Although not many people would, would know because uh, you don't really find a whole lot of Cabernet Sauvignon in the US. I, I think what ends up happening is a lot of it is consumed in New Zealand and it never really ends up <laughs> going to the US. <laughs> um, and yeah, and then as far as weather goes, um, another thing that I thought was interesting is you know, I was talking to the winemakers and um, they they were like, yeah, the weather app, like we don't even follow that. It's so unpredictable, like being a tiny little island that they are surrounded by nothing but water. There's such an unpredictability of weather and uh, possible frost uh, and just extreme shifts in weather and that, that actually reminds me of a time that it was the very last day of harvest and there was only one block remaining and it was out in the gimlet gravels and it was a Cabernet Sauvignon and um, sure enough like you know rain hadn't been in the forecast at all for 10 days but suddenly 4 p.m. there was going to be a downpour of rain for probably the next few days or the foreseeable future. So the winemaker, he pulled all the interns, including myself, the whole winemaking crew, everyone like tasting room, staff, hospitality, anyone he can get his hands on. And he was like, all right, let's all like get, hop in the car. We're going to go harvest the last block. And it was just, it was so much fun. And um, it really just brought the whole group together, but it just goes to show you like, yeah, you like sometimes the weather changes and, you know, you just have to roll with it. So. Now, were you able to eventually taste that block wine? Were you able to like taste and say, I had worked on this and you remember in this story of how crazy it was? No, I haven't. I need to get my hands on a bottle of that, though. I need to. I haven't been back to New Zealand since, so that that would definitely be a good excuse to to go down there. So <laughs> you were you were working with Cabernet there, and then now mm -hmm. you're working with Cabernet in California. So what besides, like, of course, geographic? What what's so different about the grape in different region in this in those two different regions? Because you've had experience with both. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, even in Napa, I have to say it's just like, there's a reason also why it's just like so world renowned. It's uh, the Napa itself, like tasting wise, I would say the wines are, they bring this sort of nuance and, and plushness and, and richness and, um, but also like a lot of liveliness and freshness as well. Uh, you I I love the fact that like you know you can play around with fruit that's grown all the way in the north of Napa and Calistoga where 
you know, it gets much warmer. And in fact, it could be 10 degrees warmer than it is down in Carneros. Like you could be wearing a hoodie in Carneros or you could be like ready to hop in the in the pool in Calistoga. It's just like that vastly different in even a day. Um, and then that also kind of lends itself to uh, diversity within uh, different parts of Napa. And that in itself just like gives you so many different opportunities um, and, and so many cool things to, to work with and different sites to work with within the valley itself too. Now that, that, that's amazing because we have these two wines and they're big and I, I hope everybody's tasting them and you've tasted, you know, they're vastly different. You know, and I mm -hmm. think that's when people think of California Cabernet. I think sometimes it gets lumped into these categories of just, oh, okay, it's this way. But these just show, especially these side by side comparisons of how fruit forward, then one's a little dry, but they both have this lushness and prettiness that I like to say. And I hate to say that word in the, in the way what I described the wine, but it's just a really beautiful, elegant, lush, and it doesn't feel weighty. And that's one of the things of both of them, because, you know, I, we, I tasted them a little earlier side by side. And I know people who cook the recipes and we're talking about food and how these wines completely change how those dishes taste. And one of the things that I always um, like to always talk about with food and wine pairings is you can have meat and you don't have to always have meat. That's why the recipe for the goat cheese that people, if you, you're you eating the goat cheese with the with the posted beam, is just to me an explosion of flavor. Just because goat cheese has this richness, right? That kind of, that goes, that plays on, to me, what California Cabernet can do. And also like, if you pop the, you know, I say get another bottle of both of them because you can, you can make notes and then you can talk about the ageability. I think for these wines to be, this is 2018 for both, they're just drinking so well. I mean, straight out they of the are. bottle. Like, didn't I thought at first I might have to decant them or something, but I didn't, and I was really kind of blown away by that. Absolutely, same. Um, before we joined today, I, I, you know, I opened up the bottle and I thought, oh yeah, I'm gonna have it's gonna like freeze a little bit in the glass, and no, not it was just ready to drink right out the gates, both of them, yeah, right away. Right away, right? So yeah, I know people are like, are they going to get to the wine? We're getting to the wine. I just have to like, talk about <laughs> it. It is Women's History Month, so we have, to, like, really, like, we have to really get that. So when did you get your first job at where you know you said, I'm a wine, they said, you're a winemaker. When was that? It was this job, um, I guess. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, cheers to that. It's um yeah, it was it was definitely cheers to that. Come on, yeah. cheers. To that. Cheers, cheers, to that. cheers to that. Yeah. Mm. That is so amazing because I I you know, one of the things that if people don't really know, UC Davis is currently graduating more women in winemaking than men, which is astonishing for the history they have and all the winemakers that have come through that school, which is astounding. And so I think it just shows how women are changing really just the perception of what a winemaker looks like and viticulturists. And I like to call it, you know, you all the grape whisperers because <laughs> I, like, you know, some people talk to plants. I think like oh, you yeah. guys just have a, a, a language in the vines that is just kind of like so interesting and unique because wine is all year long, especially right now. I mean, are you guys having bud break? I've been like following like some California people and they were telling me they like showing they have bud break on the on, Yeah, on yeah, Instagram. we're starting we're starting to see bud break in like kind of the south parts of Napa, definitely Russian River and Sonoma. Um and yeah, just it's it's right around the corner. Um and if it hasn't started already kind of uh up valley, it'll happen probably in the next couple of weeks, like two or three weeks for sure. Okay. So, so yeah. where the where's the po the post and beam? Has that started blood break yet? Is that area like have they started? Yeah, uh, almost. I would say okay. yeah, right around the corner, definitely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now for me, I'm. I mean, people like I'm getting a lot of cherry on this. Like when I smell this wine, I'm getting, you know, like um, like cherry pie, like a just baked cherry pie yes. that's like coming out of the oven. I'm getting that kind of delicious fruit. And when I, you know, and I, I love saying fruit because I, we don't mean sweet. <laughs> you know, what, what you oh, say, absolutely. Say 
it's just yeah absolutely it's that like that that purity of that fruit fresh out of the oven um that that aroma is definitely popping out of the glass it's very very fruit forward and also like some great layers of spice behind that like perhaps a little bit of like anise or black licorice as well oh um, yeah. I, not when you said black licorice i was like Okay, yeah, but the, one of the things like I'm I'm currently here in Louisiana, so I am eating all the crawfish southern things <laughs> that you could possibly have, and this wine is go the the reds are going with them all, which is shocking to me because I'm usually the person like oh okay, but I had these with some boudin balls, and if you've never had boudin balls, Ooh. and they're deep fried, they're basically like rice and sausage stuff oh, together, yum. and they're, they're like they're like the southern version of ar arancini. That's basically what they are okay. they're called boudin. And they're not really spicy. They just have a lot more flavor. So it just has seasonings of like the Creole seasoning for these recipes that I was giving, but it's not heat. It's just a spice. And so with the, these wines, with this fruit and this lushness actually goes with something like that, which is has blown me away because I love when I think about Napa and, you know, also we think about cab. A lot of people, you know, we, we think always, meat as far as like red meat like fillets and different like things but also I was thinking this would go well with eggplant parmesan but I didn't think about Ugh. it until after I sent the recipes and I was like I go well with eggplant parmesan too you know the mozzarella yeah you know it totally <laughs> would yeah mozzarella eggplant because eggplant has this earthiness that can and I always say roasted eggplant as well and I know sometimes people are like you know um eggplant has uh, you know, a bad rap, but if you ever had baba ganoush, which Mediterranean also something like mm. this would definitely go very well with this wine. And I hope oh my somebody, if you guys have the bottle tomorrow, I think this also, these wines, you can, they can go another day. They might not have them. You want to drink them. I get that, but they could definitely go another day or even another two days, I think. Yeah, I, I second that. Absolutely. And Julia, I think I know what's for dinner tomorrow night. Um, I plant Parmesan. <laughs> Sounds so good. <laughs> I mean, I'm trying to think of like how, you know, it's like it's winter is transitioning for some people, but yeah. it still has these really cool nights and really cool mornings and the day is kind of warm in a lot of places as we move forward to spring. But I'm a year round red wine drinker. And so for me, I'm like, well, I'm in air, you know, I'm always thinking about that. And so rich, like, I think sometimes the dish doesn't have to necessarily always be rich. I think any, also mozzarella, like mozzarella is the cheese, the goat cheese. So also because we had this panko crust on that uh, salad and also mm. the bitter green of the arugula. So that pairing is why, like all the three dishes that everyone received, both wines can go. It's the preference of, are you looking for a little more structure, which I think when we talk about the Bella Union has like that, but this is, and I, when people go with me for a second, this is, a, the Post-it Beam is a sipping Cabernet. When mm -hmm. we think of Cabernet, we don't think it, in my opinion, as a wine that's meant to be just sipped, but this is definitely a sipping Cabernet. Absolutely. Yeah, no, and I love it, and I love the, um, yeah, the concept of doing the like the vegetarian options too. And like this, this wine can like definitely hold up to all of that as well. So. Oh yeah. This is, this is just giving me joy. Like it's just. Totally. <laughs> uh, so I want to say like, so you tell us about your new job and that way we could also start talking about this new wine as we move into that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, new job. So I've been with the company for about three years now with the family of Farniente. And um, I started as the assistant winemaker for Bella Union. And uh, so yeah, I became and I was, I was uh, actually, yeah, I started in 2018. So I started in this vintage that we're, we're tasting. And uh, yeah, yeah. And then, um, and then an opportunity opened up over, you know, next, next door, nickel and nickel. So I was there for a couple of years. And then, um, you know, just the beginning of this year, um, I was uh, 
yeah, promoted to winemaker for Bell Union. So it's really fun to come back full circle to, you know, where I started with the winery and, um, and, and the company. So no, it's, it's been great. And I love being able to lead the program because my passion is, is Cabernet Sauvignon. And like, you know, like I was telling you, I've, I've, I've made it in different parts <laughs> of California in the world. And, um, yeah, it's, can you expound on your passion being Cabernet? Because I'm, you know, it's one of those things, like people ask me what two grapes I could drink for the rest of my life. And I always say Chardonnay and Cabernet and Chardonnay because it can, it makes champagne and it makes Chardonnay wine and, and then Cabernet, because just if I had to have a red wine, that would just be my choice. I'm always going, it's, it's like my roots of loving wine. So yeah. Cabernet, like what, what is it about it that that is the passion? I love Cabernet um, because it's just, it's so elegant across the board. There's like every Cabernet that I love and that I drink has a certain level of like finesse to it as well. But uh, it also has that like that, that bold structure, that rich backbone. I mean, uh, yeah, like you have to be like definitely a serious wine lover to absolutely love Cabernet Sauvignon, you know, it's, um, and like you're saying, it, it, you know, depending on, on where you're, you know, where the Cabernet is from or what, what part of Napa it's from, uh, it can, it can vary quite differently and it, and you can pair it with many different foods. Um, it's, you know, not just the steak, but it can go, um, you know, with those cheese dishes as well. And um, yeah, so it's just like super versatile as well. Yeah. It's well, it's what I lean to all the time. And you're so you're saying that cab is what brought you into the industry too, right? Yes. Texas barbecue uh, in Napa Valley Cabernet. That was like I love it. Aha that was the aha moment pairing. It was a brisket sandwich and ribs. It wasn't like this fancy like it was in someone's backyard, and I really didn't understand like tasting. And you know, it was kind of like okay, I studied abroad in France, but it was cheaper to drink wine than actually order a soda so i was like yeah. okay but really just having this like meat this messy sandwich and then this cabernet was kind of like wait a minute what just happened it was like a paradigm shift and that was when i really started exploring like wine and that was 1998 so i like really and so for me Cabernet is that comfort wine like i'd always tell people like i'm having a great day i'm not a so great day i always reach for it in a way because it's just that familiarity that I'm looking for in a glass. Totally. I love it. It's yeah, so and cool. I mean, and so that's one of the things too is like, you know, we have this wine, we have these dishes. And the re reason why I always I make I like I like leftovers. I'm one of those people I do like a lot of leftovers. I like making them bulk. It's only myself and my husband, but I make these in bulk. And the reason why I do the mushrooms over polenta is because there was a restaurant in DC that made it into a taco. And they, oh, no put way. Mush they put mushrooms in polenta and put it in a taco. And I remember just bringing it home and was like, what happened? Like, <laughs> and I had it with like a, a Cabernet and I was like, this is so easy, but it just makes a lot, right? And I was just like exploring this wine and I was just like, this is insane. And it was one of those things that I like, I want people to have this dish. So that's what I think when we're talking about this post bean wine, how great it is for that to happen and to bring people in with that dish and this wine. So, yeah, so cool. So, uh, yeah, so everybody now, um, I want everybody to grab their, I have it over here, grab their Rutherford, their Bella Union Rutherford. I mean, and I would say like, if you guys can see if you like tilt the glass, you can see the rims are just so different. That's one of the ways to under like see like the wines are like a side mm -hmm. by side comparison, especially if, like you have like a white piece of paper. But this this Bella Union, uh, uh, like just it's floral. Where to me the post mm -hmm. bean was like fruit. This is violet. Violet, is, absolutely. I was gonna say the same thing. But it's also too hibiscus. You know, I like the dried hibiscus leaves. Anybody ever had that hibiscus, like plain hibiscus tea? Like Sorrel, if you're in the Caribbean, it's Sorrel. It reminds yeah. me of having those flavors. And that's why I put this one with the short ribs. Because, I mean, 
short ribs and, and pasta. Like even if you got like it, it's just one of those dishes that just sings. Mm. Oh my gosh. I see Kaylee's coming back on. So Kaylee, you have you have some words before we just deep, deep dive into this one. I do. All right, you guys. So now it's time. I want to promote everybody to panelists. And I want, I'm asking you guys to turn on your videos and join us in a live Q&A and a happy hour toast. So let's get that going. I see people coming on. People are coming on. <laughs> Remove. Nice. There we go. And while everybody is coming on, um, I'll ask a question that was asked earlier before this um, is now that it's warming up, um, Julia, what would you pair some more chilled and cool food with it with these big calves? Okay, but first we got to give a toast. Oh, yeah, you're right. Okay, Sorry. Right. <laughs> yeah, we got to do a toast. To to Brooke and everybody at the team of um, Nicola and Nicola Farnense and Bella Union and Posted Bean. Cheers, you guys, to a great hosted at home. Thank you. Cheers. And cheers to you, Julia. So one of the things with cooler foods, I always try to think, like, do you, first the wine and then the food. You could still have, if you're having tomatoes, I'm going to say, please do not put vinegar on the tomato. All you need is great olive oil, salt and pepper. It's going to be like that season that we're going to have all those things. So look into those. And also, if you had ever had radishes and butter, like French, like creamy butter Ooh. and radishes, look at ramps also go. And What's I want to say, to okay, <laughs> did someone ask a question? No. no. Jim. Muted. Okay. Somebody's muted or? Oh. <laughs> um, I also, one of the things that goes, and it is a hard thing to pair, but if you're willing to work it out, is spring asparagus mm -hmm. risotto. Risotto, because we're talking creaminess, right? We want something with cream and cheese to balance out the acid in these wines. So we sometimes a lot of, when we think of red wine, we don't always think of acid, but these are the type of wines they do have acid. It's not a lot, but also they have integrated and structured tannin. So you're gonna also be grilling. So if you're grilling like chicken breasts or chicken thighs with the skin on, you can definitely have these red wines as well. And you could just, you know, room temperature chicken, like it doesn't have to be hot off the grill. So that's one of the things I love pairing these kind of wines with something just so different. And like, think about like a caprese salad, a simple caprese salad, basil, mozzarella, tomatoes. <laughs> and I'm, most people are not thinking of caprese salad and red wine, but that's one of my favorite pairings, is, um, especially Cabernet. I can love guys, that can recommendation. You it, can you see it, Brooke? Can you see like- I can see it. Salad pairing? Yeah. Uh, yeah, and like, just three simple ingredients, but I mean, if you have the good tomatoes, it just oh, makes such a difference. Well, you, like, especially if you're in California. I mean, California produce is like on a whole other level. I mean, you oh, know, yeah. we, we get a window on the East Coast in like, like July to August where the tomatoes are just like, just juicy. But in California, if you're in California, it can always go to something like that. And also think about pasta salads. I know a lot of people, you know, in the summertime, if you have those, with uh, once again goat cheese i wouldn't do parm because parm is giving you the salt so a lot of times but you want something that has a little richness and creaminess and so if you're making pasta salad for me that's one of the things i really enjoy as well mm -hmm. and also i think some people i can take room a lot of food room temperature i know some people don't but i will say like cold meats work as well so um Chris, Kirsten said, we've had the first two courses so far and the wines are perfectly, thank you for making that night amazing. Yes, yes. 
I'm telling you, <laughs> that is my jo- my whole thing is like in life is food and wine. For me. That is like what brings me joy. And so I'm always, I'm one of those people wake up having breakfast, eat, thinking about lunch, have lunch, thinking about dinner. And so I go, you know, I'm always looking like what works. And sometimes, you know, I, I will say experiment and play around with everything. Like I said, the eggplant Parmesan, if you have some of the wine left over, if you have like anything, stop, put it in the refrigerator. Maybe you can make the eggplant parm tomorrow or just try and see what actually worked for you. And I know um, if you don't do a lot of like, I know gluten, the gluten-free pasta, they, uh, somebody makes a red lentil gluten-free pasta. I don't know which brand it is, but it's definitely very good as well. That's like one of the top if you don't do gluten, because I know sometimes tagliatelle is kind of hard to find, a, you know, without gluten, but definitely. I've had that pasta before. I can't remember the name of it either, but I think I got it at Whole Foods. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, it's yeah. super good. It really, it really works with with these dishes as well. So, Brooke, you have to talk about this Bella Union tab for everyone on here because, like, you're you know, we have we have you on. You're starting at Bella Union, so can you explain? Yeah, this absolutely. This? Yeah. So, yeah. Cheers again. Um, this is like you said. I just I love how, like, I love the floral notes. Mm -hmm. They're just, the lifted aromatics of the violet are just so apparent and so nice. Um, And yeah, what, what to me makes this wine super special is that it really shows like what the Rutherford AVA, Rutherford AVA can bring to the table. Mm -hmm. It's like deeply concentrated on the palate um, and like rather for dust notes if you will and on the palate has like great length and and power yet elegance at the same time and um you know super refined tannins plush it's just like okay so it has it all it, okay <laughs> i love the geek because we're about to get geeky so you said rutherford dust yeah you yeah. have to explain what this rutherford dust is <laughs> don't know because i know that's like an inside baseball term so let's make the Rutherford dust. <laughs> yeah, no, Rutherford dust. So like the, so backtrack the, you know, winery Bella Union um, located off of Bella Oaks Lane in Rutherford. It's on the west side of Rutherford, just, you know, what on, yeah, west of 29 right there. And um, it's on Rutherford bench. And it's been said that, you um, that Rutherford Appellated Wines specifically have this like Rutherford dust character, specifically in the tannins, kind of that dusty tannin like, mm-hmm. um, where it's it's like this refined uh, refined tannin that ha- has just like that right amount of texture to it as well. Um, so that's what I think of when I think of Rutherford dust. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, it, and this this wine mainly is from that western part of of Rutherford itself. So okay, because when yeah. I, sometimes I, I hear people say, when I think of Rutherford dust, I think there are sometimes when you're off twenty nine and you're in that and just go with me for it's like riding on a dirt road, right? Yeah, so the dust is flying up, right? And that is actually you know you you're in vineyard vineyard sites and there's trucks and there's you guys going to work in the vineyard. So some of that dust is getting on the grapes and not in the same way where we think it's like a dusty grape, but it's just inherent in that soil. So it comes through. And if you have a pencil, like a freshly sharpened pencil, mm-hmm. sometimes people call that flint, but this kind of pencil shaving smell at first. And so sometimes when you, once the wine gets a lot of air, you still smell hints of that. Like just a little bit of like pencil shavings that actually bring out to me a lot of the char- characteristics of Rutherford. I couldn't have said it better. Like that's exactly what it is. Yeah, that's totally what it is. It's like, yeah, you're, it's like that very terroir focused wine, if you will. It, it's like you're tasting yeah. and I where, too, where it's uh, from. Everyone, if you want to do the comparison, really take a big sniff of both and then take one deep breath and then a sniff of, so you want to post and beam smell first, let that out and then take a sniff of the Bella Union and you can see the complete difference. And that's one of the ways like the interaction of the wine as well. So someone is as, as is the fruit source for post and beam, where's the fruit 
source for post and beam versus versus Bella Union? That's a great question. So post and beam is sourced from multiple vineyard sites across um, across the Napa Valley. So you have like it, it can be anywhere from um, you know up north in Calistoga to parts in Yauntville, Oakville a little bit of Rutherford, you you know, you just kind of keep going down south to Oak Knoll. So it's a great um, representation of, you know, like Napa Valley as a whole. It's a, it's a great just blend of multiple vineyard sites, whereas the Rutherford uh, is, the Rutherford Bella is 100% uh, sourced from Rutherford, our Rutherford vineyards. So, so. with also, when thinking about the post and beam fruit, and this sourcing, that is what's giving us this, all this rich fruit and complexity because it's mm -hmm. so many different vineyard sites, which means you're getting cool climate, Mediterranean, and warm climate in one glass. Yeah, absolutely. But I would say, like, if, if, you're, if you're talking of aging, also, let's, let's say 2018. 2018 was one of the best vintages in California, so we have to give thanks to the the year of great vintages for uh, in California for 2018. So I think if you, I would say, drink this now, get uh, some more bottles to age if you're into aging wine because they're going to age beautifully. That's one of like they're just and they're going to age differently, right? They're going to age I mean, and also for Bella Union for this Rutherford to be as big and bold as it is, the tannins are really integrated. Like they I'm are. not getting the tannins are there, but they're not they're not showboating the wine. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it's like, yeah, right out the gates, it's ready to drink right now. It's yeah, usually you would have to lay down a cab for a little bit longer, but the yeah, everything's very integrated, ready to drink right now. Yes. And also too, if like like I said, these wines work with a variety of foods. And I see people, and hey, I'm one of those people, I, I like to, it's like pop quiz time, so I'm going to call on, like, some people, like, because I just really like to do that. And I see <laughs> Kelly laughing, because Kelly, you're my first, and Kelly Matichak, I don't know, like, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. So I like to ask people, what do you, what do you think? Well, first of all, we need to know, what was that magical Cabernet that first turned you on to... With your sandwich. With your sandwich. Like, what... <laughs> So my, it was a brisket sandwich from Good Company Barbecue in Houston, Texas. If you ever know about Good Company, it's like a staple. And it was a 1995 Clos de Oh, and nice. And I also had, nice. with the ribs, was a Camus. And that was uh -huh. just, and he had just come from Napa. And that was like, I was like, your, your boxes are in the way of my desk. I can't go get these wine boxes. And he was like. I'm having a barbecue on Saturday. I'm going to introduce you to wine. And I was like, oh, I had wine in France. It's not a big deal. And he was like, no, I'm going to teach you about food and wine pairing. And he literally had a barbecue, I mean, potato salad, chicken, and that was it. And here, like, literally, that is the reason I started drinking wine. And a year later, I did my first solo trip to Napa in 1999 by myself. Like, I was printing out maps. This is very different. Like, you had to call, call and get a reservation and ask. And it was just kind of different. But it's it's a but to me it's my cabernet is my first love it literally was the wine that changed my life it's the grape that changed my life i say this all the time so, totally agree I'll, I'll move over i don't know if you can't quite see or uh oh, wow. nickel and nickel, <laughs> nickel, and nickel <laughs> I see so yes nickel and nickel is very close to our heart for many years so and now to learn about post and beam and bella union where, very interesting where is the post and beam uh grapes from I mean, I think, I don't know if we've hit on that before. I, I, I think might have missed it. Yeah. 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 So the post and beam grapes are from multiple vineyard sites, like throughout Napa Valley itself. Um, so yeah, we have like, we have vineyards up in Calistoga and um, yeah, for this first vintage, we, um, we also pulled some fruit from our own estate vineyards that were, you know, existing um, in our other, you know, sister winery programs as well. So you'll see, uh, you know, some, some, a little bit of Oakville, a little bit of Rutherford, a little bit of Oak Knoll. So um, yeah, just a good little, little blend. 
Awesome. Well, and when you, uh, as soon as you source from Coombsville, we'll be, we'll be right behind you, uh, ready to go to get uh, Bella Union Coombsville. We'll be ready for that one too. Hey, yeah, I love Coombsville. Farniente, Farniente Chardonnay is grown in Coombsville, a lot of it. It's, yeah, love, love that site. <laughs> Are you guys oh. in Coombsville? No, we're in Virginia. We're in Virginia. Oh, you're in Virginia. We're in Virginia. Oh. Oh. I wish you were in Coombsville right now. That would be nice. What part of Virginia? What part of Virginia? Northern Virginia, um, outside of Washington, D.C. I'm in Hyattsville. I'm in, not in Hyattsville right now. I'm like, I live in Hyattsville. Oh, I, th I thought you were in Louisiana. So I'm I, mean, I, 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 I can't have to come to the family, so I had to. I'm oh, okay. a month, so that's why. Oh, yeah. yeah. Nice. Oh, nice. Good. good to know. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Good thank to meet you, you all. Thank you. you. you well done, thank Brooke. You. <laughs> thank yeah, you. Thank you. So I see somebody, is that Michael with the glass waving in front of the camera? Somebody like, my, like he's giving me the eye or something. Hey, Michael. Yeah, hi. <laughs> How are you? Yeah. Hi, Michael. <laughs> We're enjoying the wine. Thank you. Did you make any of the dishes? Did you make any of the dishes? No, we have uh, special dietary needs here tonight. So we kind of did other things. Okay, but well, is the wine going with those dietary needs? Absolutely. It's going down very well. Good. Okay. That's the most important thing. Right? Yes. That's the most yes. important thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I see John Reed said he made the short rib. So John, like, what do you think of this pairing? I know you, you can come off mute, John. Thank you. <laughs> oh, it's delicious. We love it. It's, um, rich and it's got a nice mouthfeel to it that just complements the wine beautifully. Do, would you make it again? A hundred percent. Absolutely. Yeah. That, the, the short ribs just fall off the bone. Absolutely. Did you do like the Instapot yeah. version or the, cause I sent an Instapot version and like the regular oven version. Which one did you do? We did the oven version okay. and our kids absolutely love it. They did not have the wine. But they <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's good to know. That's good to know. Delicious. That's one of the things about like if you make the dish, and also it's really great as leftovers. If you want to do uh, tacos, if you want to do just a short rib in like yes. a taco, that's an actual great another pairing to do with short rib leftovers. I was thinking doing it with uh, corn tortillas rather than the flour tortillas. <laughs> yes. Um, and the polenta with the mushrooms is a good idea and the tacos too, but we did not make that this time. Okay. And one of the things too, I will say when you, when you do the mushrooms and the polenta, if you have leftovers, take a like muffin tin or like, you know, like a separate muffin tin and fill those, like spray them with like a cook, like an avocado oil, spray them, I, fill uh -huh. them and then freeze them. And you could have like one single serving. And then when you're ready to rehydrate it, just add a few tablespoons of water and zap it in the microwave. Okay, so I, I have a question. When we got the mushroom recipe, it actually mm -hmm. didn't say what to do with the mushrooms. I believe it was called roasted mushrooms, but yes. it didn't say how long to roast them or what temperature or anything like that. So that's um, my thought is 350 for 40 minutes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, we just sauteed them. Yeah, we sauteed the mushrooms and had them on the okay. side with the short ribs. That's fine. That's fine. But even if you have like the leftovers though, of either way, if you saute them or uh, put them in the oven, mm -hmm. you could just have, the, you could, if you put them, mix them with the polenta, it's like having like your own little mushroom, like leftover for when you need it. Oh, that sounds so good. Yeah. We'll definitely do that. Lauren said the next recipe should just be boudin. Love that pairing. I did not discover mm -hmm. that until I was here. I had like, of course it's crawfish season and I had the post and beam with crawfish. So if you live in a place where there are seasoned crawfish, that wine goes well. And so I just like, oh, I have a boudin ball, let me try it. And I was blown away. I was shocked because I was going to pair it with a white wine. And then I was like, nope, not at all. I am gonna stick with the red. And so that's something to, um, I will say if you don't live in a place where there's boudin and crawfish, there's a place called um, goldbelly.com that you can order food from Louisiana. And all you have to do is just pair the wine with that. And that's something to do as well with the with the different wines to, ex to explore them. So I have a quick question, Brooke, about the Bella Union. So 
how long, like, was it, I want to ask about the Oak integration. That was something I forgot to ask also about the post and beam. New Oak, American Oak, French Oak, Neutral Oak, how long in Oak? Yeah, great question. So for both wines, they're both French Oak. No American Oak was used. And um, the Bella Union was probably closer to like 60% new French Oak. Um, and then the rest, a uh, combination between like once used and once and twice used oak. And then uh, post and beam, you're gonna see a little bit more neutral oak, uh, just a touch of, of new oak as well. Um, but, but yeah, fewer aging months on that. So to, to me, that makes a little bit of sense too when, when drinking it as well, um, because it's, you know, it, it's more fruit, like fruit focused and fruit forward on that that post and beam and and not as much oak um, impression as the the Bella Rutherford. So how how long in oak for the post and beam? Post and beam Just probably like, like, like twelve months, okay. más o menos. Yeah, yeah. So and and what about the Bella Union? Eighteen months for Bella Union on the oak. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And it's all new for the Bella, right? Um, I would say yeah, like sixty percent new 60%, for Bella. Okay. And all yeah. French for both. All French for both. Okay. That's where it's getting the structure. Like exactly. I think that is laying down for so long. And then how long are they laid down in the bottles? Um, let's see. I'm trying to think. Right? Probably like yeah, like a year and a half, perhaps. Yeah, a year and a oh, half. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. so that's a long time. That's that's why everything's so integrated. Because even though yeah. technically, quote unquote, they're young, I mean, we're talking now, we're talking a three year old wine, right? They're still young, but they mm -hmm. don't drink young. They drink with like they're tasting with a little more age on them, which I would love to have, like, see these evolve in a couple of years and how, you know, it will be different from, and also because 2018 was such a great year. 2018 was such a good year. Yeah, we were so lucky. It was like a year of, abundance it, we had like the the quality and the quantity going for us which you rarely see both of that happening at the same time and every everything just came into alignment for 2018 <laughs> so we're hoping that for 2021 i think it yes everybody in the wine world actually deserves that we all need that kind of look in the world anyway for all of us absolutely to actually have, uh, wines as well so i want to so I got to, I love asking this question. So since you're the winemaker, you come home, been at work all day. What do you, what the, what glass do you pour yourself? Oh, that's a good question. Just like during the week or on the weekend or just doesn't matter. It, it, it's up to you. You answer like, if, I'm thinking more during the week. Like it's not Friday. It's like Monday through Thursday. You've been out, you know, in the vine, you've been at work, you know, making great wine and you come home. What do you pour for yourself? Yeah, so I think to me, it depends on like the season or the time of year, like during harvest, um, we love getting together with our crew. Um, and like, I'm, I usually drink wine over, you know, cocktails or beer generally, but there's nothing that tastes better than an icy cold beer at the end of the like work day, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but I also like lately I've, um, lately just like within the past month or so I've been getting into like Italian uh whites and reds particularly like Sicilian uh reds because they're you know just super easy and friendly um uh, so I've been doing that and um and then I just also love Pinot too so like I'll have our en route Pinot as well um yeah, I feel so lucky That's we have delicious. like a, an amazing delicious. portfolio of wines just if within our. If you haven't had the en route Pinot Noir, oh, I love the en route Pinot Noir. It's really delicious. Yeah, it's really so delicious. good. It's so good. Yeah. yeah, and they have like the single vineyards as well, mm -hmm. in addition to the Le Pommier. Oh, and their Chardonnay is awesome. I yeah. love that Chardonnay. Yeah. It's one of those things like when we had the first, I think DC got like a snowstorm. I, when the first snowstorm, I always have like a very, very cold white wine, like usually Chardonnay, once again, it's usually California because of that. And then the hottest day when it's like, if you, DC is on a swamp. So it's like, you know, you guys always like sticky. I always have a Cabernet. 
because it's so opposite of what I'm supposed to be drinking. I just want to drink something completely opposite. And I always feel like we're inside so I can drink it kind of year round. But I want something like I, when I'm looking and, and tasting the comparing the two, I, that's why I go back to the post and bean is definitely a sipping Cabernet. Mm-hmm. Like it is one and like you, you can choose to have food, which I always say wine tastes better with food. But you could choose not to as well. You could. It, it's a wine that works with snacks. I believe the structure and the and the and the boldness of the Bella Union needs food, whereas like the Post and Bean can kind of get away with snacks. Yeah, it's funny you say that about the snacks because literally last weekend, um, it was such beautiful weather like here in Napa. Um, it was like Saturday or Sunday afternoon. Um, I made like an awesome cheese board. I've been super into just like making elaborate cheese boards lately. <laughs> and I had some post and bean with it and it was so good. I had some um, like some goat cheese with it um, and like a little bit of manchego as well. In addition, you know, to all, all the works and everything. But yeah, it was such a good pairing. I, I'm going to challenge you. Are you like, a, <laughs> anybody on the call, anybody like a chips person? Does anybody, everybody like chips? Okay. Go with me here for a second. The Lay's barbecue, not the Ruffles barbecue, they not the same. The Lay's barbecue with the post and bean because it has this sweetness. The mesquite barbecue, if anybody knows what I'm talking about, like, like so just it, it will go with the post and bean. If you just want chips and wine, I know Olivia Pope on Scandal did popcorn and red wine. I like barbecue chips and red wine. That is like I'm, do- I'm doing it immediately. <laughs> I'm trying it out. <laughs> but the ruffles taste different, and I, I it's it, I don't know if it's an oil thing on this, but the ruffles taste different. So I would definitely tell you to do the Lay's Mesquite barbecue chips mm. with the post and bean, and try that like as a snack pairing. I know most I, people like I oh love my that. God, like. <laughs> because I want I want wine to be approachable, right? I want I I love making these recipes and everything like that, but sometimes you just want like a snack and there's like, hey. it has to be like a chip. You know. Yeah, and sometimes you need a snack, you know, while you're making your dinner or, you know, before your dinner too, right? So yeah, yes. have have your wine and your snack pairing before your you move on to your next wine and your next entree. Now you make me want to have like the manchego and like figure that part out. Oh yeah. Because I want, oh, see, this is why I love having these calls. Mesquite potato chip, slice of manchego, or gouda, and the post and bean. I, yeah. The smoked gouda, the smoked gouda on that. I see Kelly's face is like, yeah, kind of like, you can, in your, in your, in your head, you can go <laughs> there. So I would say that would be a great one to actually have something like so different. Like if you guys like, uh, Kaylee, you might want to look into this for your next and host it at home. Tell somebody to like figure out like a little snack, not just a recipe, but a snack to go with some of the wines as well. I think that'll be fun. Yeah, because it's it, it will change your life. Uh, barbecue potato chips and, and Cabernet from Napa is just one of those things as well. Yeah, uh, Kaylee. Yeah, she said, "Yum." We would recommend the 2015 Farnente um, Cab- Ooh, Cabernet. Cave Cabernet. Yeah, because they said, uh, what's the best for family pairing for corned beef and cabbage? Oh, no. That sounds good. <laughs> well, it's, it's St. Patrick's Day coming up. Oh, so. that's right. <laughs> that's right. But you know what? I think um, the corned beef and cabbage would actually go with the, with because of that Rutherford dust, the Bella Union, over the posted bean. Because it has a little more earth going to it. I could see that. I can definitely see that. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Really, I actually see Patrick's Day plans. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was no, just going to say, like, that's a great St. Patrick's Day combo right there. <laughs> yes, Jim, always Guinness. Always Guinness, always Guinness of course. Guinness, right? <laughs> you had a question for me? I do, because I love how enthusiastic you are and all the things that you mentioned about food and wine sound fabulous. And, New Orleans is like one of our favorite places for food. Mm-hmm. And I'm just curious if you have a recommendation what your favorite restaurant or dish is there. Okay. So I, <laughs> a whole other, so I normally for crawfish, I don't go to restaurants. I go to this place called Claiborne. And there's like a they're like 
a, like a grocery store, like a hole in the wall in Nitrame and get their crawfish because I think they're some of the best crawfish in the cheapest if you're outside of Bourbon Street, right? Because, you know, Bourbon Street marks things up. But if I want to go balls to the wall, I go to Commander's Palace or Brennan's and get the turtle soup. Hands down. And I know that sounds crazy for all y'all on the call, like turtle soup. That's the only place I eat it. I will never make that dish. <laughs> it, is like, it is so rich, though. If no one told you it was a turtle soup, you wouldn't know that. But I also like places like the hole in the wall that you find when you're like the side street of bourbon. But for me, like I love charbroiled oysters. And you Croissant. can go, um, yeah, in the one in the Hilton that Hotel. Right, but if you actually catch an take an Uber or car service, the original one is in Metairie, which is twenty miles outside of New Orleans. It'll blow your mind because it started it started as a fire truck. They were charbroiling them on an old fire truck, hmm. and so because it's, it's New Orleans, Louisiana, you can BYO bottle, bring your own bottle, <laughs> so you can bring your <laughs> wine. But I will say that those that those are the places, and then uh, um, compare La Pen, uh, Nina, who was on Top Chef has uh, the way she takes on like crawfish etouffee because a lot of times people don't realize like etouffee is more roux based as jambalaya is more soft red sauce based and there's just a different influence but hands down if you just want to go eat your heart out go to Giacomo's um it was destroyed with Katrina they brought it back but they have something called alligator pie there's no alligator in it it is basically cornbread stuffed with oysters shrimp crawfish they bring it to a table in a cast iron skillet there's they take melted butter and pour it on top and you dish it out crawfish pie i mean alligator pie and so, no alligator in it. <laughs> so <laughs> those are like my you know what about top but yeah like but i will say the tr the classics that are there commanders brennan's acme for like oysters all of those mothers for like those things i think you should go to the class and then see what else a lot of people are doing but um you know it's new it's new orleans you can like you can try to eat your weight in food but then you're done like the next day you like recovering and then you got another third day to try to do it again so it's like you know yeah yes oh uh, yeah la petite grocery is fantastic on magazine and also central grocer yeah, all those central things. grocer the muffalata the muffalata sandwich from central grocer is on gold's belly so I will say I order Gold Belly. I order from a place called A Bears. It looks like Hebert's, H E B E R T S. They have shrimp gumbo. They also have boudin, uh, like the links and everything. But they also have uh, Louisiana fish, uh, Louisiana meat pies, meat pies, shrimp pies, crawfish pies. You just put them in an oven for 45 minutes on a pan, and that's all you do. It's just like basically puff pastry stuff with food with etouffee. That's it. And then all you have, then you have your Bella Union wine, yeah. you have your poster beam, and you're yes. fisting, and you're good. Like that's what you're doing. That is what you're doing. <laughs> so I think Kaylee is your time to come. Um. Oh, wait a minute, Dr. Vince. GW fans for seafood. That is right. Yes. Okay. GW fans. Yes. Yes. Oh, and another thing too, beignets, sweet dishes go with savory wine. So think about the post and beam with the beignets so you don't always necessarily need a sweet wine with the same alcohol level the sugar level of a dish it's kind of what like why blue cheese and red wine goes together kind of like that kind of whole concept almost like a salty sweet savory sweet that's what you're trying to go for <laughs> yes so um anybody else have any other questions any last questions? Or are you guys just ready, like to like finish drinking? <laughs> Hi, I have a, I have a question. Um, yes. My name is Will, by the way. So I think you both spoke about um, inspirational experiences in France, and and Napa is kind of like the the Bordeaux of the U.S. in a way. I'm interested in in like how much interaction there is between winemakers in Napa and in Bordeaux, and do you have any kind of chateaus in Bordeaux that you see as really inspirational um, for the wine that you make at Famiente, or do you really Kind of just do your own thing so um yeah no that's a great question um i have yet to reach that point in my career where i am interacting with um you know bordeaux winemakers um but i do 
keep in touch with, um, you know, with wineries and winemakers that I've been to, uh, that I've met personally in, you know, in Burgundy and like in Italy and in New Zealand and whatnot. Um, and of course, yeah, I mean, they're, they're always the inspiration and, um, uh, you know, the inspiration why cab was even like even started growing in Napa in the first place. Um, and yeah, when it comes to, you know, making our wines within the Farniente family, uh, we, we set to make wines, like, you know, wines of place. So, you know, although you'll see some similarities between, you know, between the regions, uh, the, the difference, you know, comes down to making wines of place, uh, of our particular climate, which, you know, tends to overall be slightly a little bit warmer overall. Um, we can kind of get that like that riper, more deeply like concentrated fruit. Um, so yeah, there's always that respect for those international wines, absolutely. Um, while also focusing in on, you know, what, what we grow here. Um, so yeah, but yeah. I, 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 I would say too, with that, William, if we think of how Bordeaux is divided, right bank, left bank, right? I think when we're talking about left bank, we can really talk a lot about really like Sonoma, I mean, Napa, because we're talking mm -hmm. about the same Cabernets of Malbec. And so if we move it into Pomerol and say all those right bank Merlots, you could actually move also closer into areas that like once in future getting closer to like Livermore Valley. And you could just kind of go up because there's just that style. So I think for me, um, left bank is more Napa kind of in right bank is more, you know, Anderson Valley, Livermore Valley, move Santa Barbara, that kind of part of California. That's just my personal take on on how the they, they kind of differ in similarities, but we're just very thankful for Vitus Vernifera of Cabernet Sauvignon. Yeah. Thank you so much for that question. I, that, now I want to explore that. <laughs> not on my own I just want to personally explore that question right like yeah yeah no, that's such a great question yes any other questions before I turn it back over to Kaylee Kaylee it's time to shine baby girl all right, you guys. Well, thank you so much, Julia and Brooke and everybody. This has been so much fun. Um, next week, you'll receive an email, which includes uh, information on the wines in the next shipment and a recording of today's tasting. And if you really enjoyed, um, don't forget you can use the code HOSTED uh, at checkout and you'll receive a 20% savings and complimentary shipping. But um, thank you so much. And I hope you guys have a fabulous weekend and cheers again. Happy Saturday night, you guys. Bye. Thank you so much for having me in your home. Yes. Bye. Thank chip, you, everyone. Try the chips and the post and beans. Yes, definitely. Thank you, guys.